A mystical experience that was once widely sought by pre-Columbian Aztec communities involved the singing of a genre of sacred hymns that are known today as the Cantares Mexicanos, the songs of the Mexicans. These indigenous canticles were liturgical in character and represented a remnant of Native American spirituality that was lost to the ages, no more than a century or two following the Spanish conquest. And around 90 of these songs were recorded in the Aztec language of Nahuatl, some 30 to 50 years after the arrival of Cortes to the shores of Veracruz, which resulted in an historical hymnal of sorts that laid lost and forgotten within colonial archives of Mexico until the middle of the 19th century. Modern attempts to understand the mythic and ritual content of these songs are based today almost entirely, on detailed studies of language specialists in the field of classical Nahuatl. We discuss the poetic aspects of these records in a separate episode on Paradise Earth in a podcast. And in that recording, we cover the divergence of scholarly approaches and opinions on these hymns, according to Mexican and U.S. linguists many of whom have drawn quite different conclusions in their respective attempts to translate and explain the meaning of these ceremonial songs. It is recommended, though not particularly necessary, for those that follow this site to listen in on that podcast before viewing the present video. In this episode, we intend to examine, for the first time, a variety of symbolic and mythic themes of the Cantares in in terms of their relation to the religious and mythic imagery that we have uncovered in archaeological records from this distant time and place in human history, namely the Central Valley of Mexico during the Spanish conquest. Bearing in mind that native singers and dancers in the Valley of Mexico believed that these rituals could provoke a personal encounter with the spirits of past kings, with the spirits of former military heroes of the Aztec Empire and with the creator of the Aztec cosmos itself, the songs suggest that Aztec singers would witness the descent of the ghosts of important personages and armies of times past. These spirits would descend from the heavens in the form of reincarnate birds and flowers to join in Aztec song and dance during rituals that were intended to atone the celebrants, present and past, with a creator god by the name of Ipaltinemich, his name meaning life-giver. Mysteriously, Aztec songsters also proclaimed that they themselves would also become divine flowers and birds in the process, as they warbled and twittered to their heart's delight upon their imaginative entry into the aquatic paradise of their creator, Ipaltinemi. So it seems appropriate that we begin this video by first considering some pictorial impressions of the mystical landscape in which these out-of-body experiences would take place on a yonder and verdant shoreline of their creator, life giver. The Mexica people in the Valley of Mexico referred to the home of their god as a tolan, a term that means a place of reeds. One of those Tolan sites in the Cantares, referred to as Tolan Nonoalco, also called Tamuanchan, provided the shorelines on which life givers, divine flowers, and singing birds could congregate. Or in the words of one song, all you participants are arriving from the eternal shores of Nonoalco, you swans of a life giver, you among his creatures. That divine plant with turquoise swan flowers lies yonder in the turquoise picture house. It abides beyond because it comes from God. Now, the Mexican Tovar Codex from the late 16th century portrays Tula, the Spanish pronunciation of Tolan, as a fertile body of water that teems with fish on a shoreline of cattails. 
The word tol in Nahuatl means cattails, or more generically, any number of reedy aquatic plants. We note that a matrix of aqueous fluxions in this illustration are marked with two distinctive symbolic water signs, one being circlets, known as jade signs, or chalchiwitl, as well as a tapering ellipsoid structure with a longitudinal line uh, that runs through it. The Central Valley of Mexico was formerly covered by a complex of lakes and interconnected canals filled with reedy habitats. So various tolans are recognized in the 90 or so hymns of the Cantares. One frequently cited reed place of the Cantares, Tolan Nonoalco, has been located by historians in the Gulf coastal states of Veracruz and Tabasco, which suggests that their concept of divine space extended far beyond the confines of their mountainous basin. Tropical tolans, then, of such type, are represented by just about any tropical pond found in the steamy lowlands of Mexico and Central America. Another impression of Tolan is illustrated in the 16th century Codex Chichimeca Tolteca, which highlights some ecological features of riparian habitats that were once common in the Valley of Mexico. Here we observe a pair of Montezuma cypress trees, actually an aquatic redwood tree, some tall and dominant cattails in the background, bulrushes in the foreground, fruiting cotton plants on the left, and the only plants that actually stand out with showy flowers, these being water lily flowers, observed on the right side of the waters. The latter plants are referred to generically as reed flowers in the Cantares, or more specifically as Atlaquitzonan flowers, which life giver whirls down from his heavenly shores for the benefit of singers and devotees. A song number 61 relates, You come whirling down from Tamuanchan, the flower seat. Ah, flowers burgeon, song root flowers. From within these flower plumes, you sing, O oh God, you make the fragrance, you stand whirled. So let's all be pleasured. The pigmented water lilies in this rendering of Aztec paradise are probably modeled after Nymphaea elegans, a native species of Mexico whose populations and ranges are much reduced in distribution today, and unfortunately altogether gone from the Valley of Mexico. Natural populations of Nymphaea elegans bear flower petals that can be either white blue, or pink pigmented. They represent the only Mexican water lily species that, that exhibits flower color variation with these specific hues. And when viewing natural populations of these plants, one can appreciate the frequent references in Aztec songs to the so-called jade-colored reed flowers, which they describe as amassing on the creator's shoreline. These plants are said to be stand-up plants with breaking jades, and they whirl from the heavens as fragrant and turquoise flowers. To quote, You live before God's face, you all, a morass of flowers. You live and blossom here on earth. As you stir, quivering, then flowers fall, everlasting the flowers. Or in another stanza, your flowers are stirring. You are blooming as jades. You are leafing multitudes. Your flowers, oh God. A scene that portrays a grove of Nymphaea elegans was executed adeptly by mural painters at the famous temple of Tepantitla during the classic period of Mexican history which is to say, around 1,800 years ago. Positioned due east of the famous and grandiose Temple of the Sun at Teotihuacan, 
These wall paintings served some sort of religious purpose during the city's heyday, which endured until around the, the 7th century AD. But even after Teotihuacan was abandoned in favor of other Mesoamerican urban centers, its ruins served as a pilgrimage site for the famous Aztec emperor Montezuma II during the Age of the Conquest. And perhaps these very walls, or painted walls like them, bear some relation to the frequent allusions to jade water and jade plant paintings in the Cantares. As one hymn chimes, You come from the land of painted waters, you arrive with your picture painting songs. At flower house of paintings, in the flower house of butterflies, yonder in God's home. So as a song, you're born. We do not actually know what language was spoken by the founders of Teotihuacan, but their image of paradise is wholly consistent with descriptions of life givers yonder shores in the Cantares Mexicanos. Here we observe an individual masquerading as a divine bird, a Quetzal bird to be exact, and he strides across a reedy body of water, a tolan, while pouring forth a flow of water that is simply jam-packed with water lily buds and flowers. That the flowers are dripping with nectar and weeping with eye insignias is also consistent with recurrent lyrical motifs of the Cantares. Now admittedly, there is 1,500 years of separation between the painting of these murals and the authorship of our Aztec hymns. But we shall soon see that patterns of symbolism that we encounter at Tepantitla and also their rendering of Teotihuacan gods are also found among other Mesoamerican ruins and reflect many, if not all, of the metaphorical themes of the Cantares Mexicanos. For having fallen within water from the heavens, the flowers awaken to the dawn, shine like the sun, and gleam in what the Cantares describe as the sun-struck dew of Tolan. The requisite use of two types of drums to accompany the Cantares complements an abundance of post-conquest illustrations of Aztec singing rituals and calls to mind from the Cantares the following refrain, where flowers stand and from there beyond the drums of Tamuanchan are sounding, there the shield flowers are stirring. One song entitled Dikan Umpewa Teponasquikat, or Here Begins the Long Drum Song, is introduced with the written intonations of a drum. Tiko Tiko Toko Toto, followed then by the lyrics, and then in concluding with more percussive onomatopoeia. Tikiti Titito Titi. And to the beat of these drums, the hymns proceed to praise the shorelines of Tolan Chololan and Tolan Nonoalco for their feathered swans and the lords of whirling golden flowers. They sing, Who will chant the words of the only creator? With these songs, these wewetl drums, these teponastli drums, and rattles, ah, golden flowers are blossoming, flowers that give pleasure to the earth. So, to the moaning of conch shells and the shaking of rattles, the wewetl drum, a large and upright instrument, and the teponastli drum, a smaller, horizontal, two-tone percussive instrument, singers and dancers would reenact the history of their historical war heroes as though they had descended to earth in the form of whirling flowers. Spanish clergy could not reasonably prohibit the use of traditional instruments or the singing of well-known songs among local communities, but the religious content of the traditional lyrics were scrutinized very closely, often by well-placed spies and native informants of the church, to keep a check 
on nativist backsliders that felt inclined to cleave to their oral traditions and to worship their former gods and goddesses. Jesuit and Franciscan friars would eventually play an integral role in the alteration and management of song and dance programs, beginning with the modification of the lyrics to the old melodies so as to eliminate all references to historical deities. Along with prohibitions against worshiping gods of the past, the monks prescribed severe punishments for uncooperative natives that were unwilling to give up their old ways. These church policies were supported by the destruction of Aztec temples and ritual implements, such as native books, altars, and altar pieces, often by fire, leaving behind very little, save for the newly constructed Catholic churches and monasteries that were, at this point, filled with Christian altars and Christian icons. To the beat of the Huehuetl and to the Teponastli, the Cantares Mexicanos were performed by participants that disguised themselves as warriors or divine animals so as to identify themselves as the floral and avian reincarnations of, of fallen heroes, as well as to the traditional zoological emissaries of their creator. Metaphorical themes that relate to warfare are employed in a significant portion of the songs, yet there is not a single reference to the killing of a person or an animal. Quite the contrary, the whole purpose of the ceremony was to experience the pleasures of God's paradise on earth and to express a heartfelt gratitude for the opportunity to do so. In the entourage of singers observed here, we take note of two individuals that disguise themselves as an eagle and a jaguar, these being two important symbols of Aztec warfare that share symbolic relationships with the sacred flowers and bird avatars of the Cantares Mexicanos. Since the use of drums, and specific types of drums, were essential to these performances, we are fortunate to have uncovered several specimens of these instruments among the ruins of some important Aztec sites. The decorative carvings that we observe on these pieces provide additional insights into the meaning of these enigmatic hymns in ways that have yet to be explored or recognized in the literature. One such drum that dates from the 16th century is now displayed in Mexico's National Anthropological Museum, and it integrates a number of symbolic signs and images that are wholly consistent with the focal themes of the Cantares. And they do so to such an extent that one is given to assume that this particular drum once accompanied the singing of the Xochiquicatl, the flower songs. The most prominent figures on the drum include a cosmic eagle that has touched down with another bird on a water surface, upon which a polypetalous flower with a large ovarian disc is floating. Following iconographic tradition, only half the flower is portrayed in this execution so as to suggest a profile view of the blossom. And we note that the flower emits a blaze, or some sort of aura. Observe as well that the corolla of the flower is comprised of numerous petals that are portrayed realistically on the inner two whorls of the blossom, but stylistically on the outermost whorl. Bear this image in mind, for we shall later find that these stylized petal renderings on other iconographic materials relate as well to Aztec floral imagery. This particular flower is readily identified as a water lily, since no other aquatic flower in Mexico shares the combination of numerous petals and a large cup-shaped pistil in its center. And it reminds us of flower songs that specifically identify the wondrous jade reed flowers as tlapalal atlaquesonan, meaning multi-hued water lilies. 
This botanical determination is also inferred by details relating to the eagle that has descended upon the water blossom. For we observe a well-known symbolic motif that is held between the two birds, this being a classic Aztec insignia for divine warfare, traditionally known as the Atl Tlachinoli motif, meaning literally a water and fire insignia. Atl is the Nahuatl word for water, and Tlachinoli, the word for blaze, water blaze. The symbol takes the form of two divergent fluxions of water, one producing a combination of circlets and snail-like or bud-like ellipsoid designs on its surface, and another intertwining fluxion that terminates in the profile of a polypetalous flower that emits flames. Now importantly, if you take a close look, you will note that the floral design on the Atlatlachinoli motif matches precisely with the large flower floating on the water surface. So this flower appears to be a pyrogenic water lily standing in water. And would this not be the same flower referred to in the following refrain of the Cantares? In blaze land, bearing fragrance, you stand filled with sun rays, as flowers. God is he that shines among the jaguar blades. He, as an eagle, screams. Yet, as I mentioned in our podcast on these hymns, the bellicose eagles and jaguars never seize or attack an adversary. Rather, they are sent to pleasure the singers as flowers with their sunstruck morning dew. Consider as well the following stanza. Aquatic flowers, that would be a sochiat, a water flower, all ablaze come stirring. So there you have it, O princes. Life giver places his arrows, his shields, as flowers in your hands. Blaze flowers, tlachinol xochitl, war flowers, yao xochitl. Who doesn't want them? Who doesn't yearn for them, O princes? Or in another refrain, we Mexicans are submerged in the water plants. Water blaze flowers. Which, as we now know, is a water lily blazing like a sun, as we shall soon see, on the water's edge as a feathery eagle. Yet strangely, as weapons of war, i.e. as shields and arrows, they are described as flowers that place themselves in the hands of the ghost warriors. They'll never die, these war flowers. They amass, ah, on the shore, on the flood's border, these jaguar flowers, these shield flowers are blooming. Or again, your city in jade land is arising on an arrow of flaming flowers. O oh, soul spirit, with take heart where flood and blaze are spreading, where empire, kingship, and divine flowers are one. With sword and shield, on the battlefield of earth. You earn sacred flowers that you desire. Taking what you want, my friend, those that the people deserve, those that he, God, entrusts to you, he, the ever-present, the ever-near. A similar Aztec drum, the same size and design, was discovered in a relatively small and isolated cultic center for jaguar and eagle spirits at Malinalco, about an hour's drive today, southwest of modern Mexico City. Here, before the arrival of Europeans, a goddess by the name of Malinal Xochitl, Xochitl being the Aztec word for flower, the title meaning flower of Malinalco, was worshipped. 
And we notice that this wewet is decorated with stylized images of a jaguar and eagle spirits in association with the atl tlachinoli motif, along with its blazing water lily. The central band that surrounds the drum probably represents the same water line we observed on the Wewetl from Tenochtitlan. Upon this water surface, we observe carved arrows and shields. We note that each shield bears a cluster of round symbols that probably represent water lilies. All of these symbolic themes are consonant with the following lyric. O life giver, there, a jaguar, an eagle sprouts. There, lords are blossoming. They are rising in a blaze. Let's be pleasured, our friends. Let princes be pleasured on this field. Let there be a coming forth to life. We recall that a similar jaguar spirit among the Maya was also closely associated with water lilies this god bearing the name of Water Lily Jaguar, who conventionally frolics among his lotus groves on the Gulf Coastal Plain of eastern Mexico, ostensibly not so far from Tolan, Nonoalco of the Aztecs. But in the Valley of Mexico, Aztec singers assumed this identity themselves by impersonating the creatures that symbolized or were related to Aztec floral weapons. But not here alone, for similar rituals were practiced on the east side of the volcanic range that separates the Valley of Mexico from the valley and state of Puebla, where jaguar and eagle flower spirits also convened for flower wars at Tolan Chololan and Tolan Huesotzinco. Those sites would be Cholula and Huejotzingo of modern Mexico. To quote the Cantares, These feathery flood flowers, these blaze flowers, go budding, go swelling. Arrows and shields are now our duty here in Chololan, in Huejotzingo. Or even farther east in the state of Puebla, near Tlaxcala, we encounter detailed mural paintings at a site known as Kakashtla, no more than a day's walk from Tolan Chololan. And here we encounter once again associations between the same symbolic elements, water lilies and Tolan habitats. Here we encounter, however, hybrid expressions of Aztec and Maya iconography. Mural paintings at this site portray a man that has assumed the role of a Maya slash Aztec warrior spirit who wears Maya warrior garb and upon his head he dons a skull of the so-called Maya water lily monster with a water lily bud ear flare. He pours water from an urn that is decorated, however, with the face of the Aztec water lily spirit known as Tlaloc a highly stylized rendering of a Maya wa white water lily stalk is tucked into his belt, while a serpent that bears a white trefoil stretches across his arms. The imagery seems pretty consistent with the following refrain. They'll never die, these war flowers. They amass, ah, on the flood's border. These jaguar flowers, these shield flowers are blooming. Flowers that open on the warrior's serpentine water lily stems there across his belt match closely with several white flowers that sprout from a body of water that surrounds the sea, which share company with frogs, turtles, snails, and several aquatic insect nymphs. The same aquatic flower is observed in larger scale as a white polypetalous flower viewed in profile, positioned on the tip of an Aztec feathered serpent tail, from which long Quetzal feathers extend. 
The placement of a water lily on the tail of a Maya and or Aztec serpent follows a standard iconographic practice throughout Mesoamerica. A complete perspective of the feathered serpent reveals its traditional associations with a Quetzal bird as well as a water lily. The bird can be seen hovering beside the serpent's body. This symbolic theme is also employed in the Cantares. Sunstruck flower drums stand beyond their beaming. Like a fan of Quetzal plumes, they radiate greenness. A fuller perspective on this feathered serpent includes an avian warrior spirit whose aspect suggests a hybrid eagle Quetzal bird spirit. This is a hybrid icon that wears Maya war garb in the form of a bellicose bird, but stands on an Aztec-styled feathered serpent. I find it interesting that delicate water lily flowers were as much a symbolic feature in Maya war symbolism as they were in Aztec war symbolism. In a separate episode on Paradise Earth regarding Maya world tree symbolism, we note that the coat of arms for the famous Maya dynast Pakal at Palenque in the state of Chiapas was a shield with the face of a sun god surrounded by four water lily signs on a turtle carapace. And interestingly, the close and specific connections between the water lily and, and war shield symbolism was no less relevant to Aztec traditionalists. Indeed, several aquatic members of the Aztec pantheon, including four manifestations of the water lily god Tlaloc, along with his consorts, including Chalchiuhtlicue, a goddess known as Jade Skirt, and Sochi Quetzal, the Quetzal flower, distinguished themselves in the Aztec pantheon by wielding a distinctive water lily shield, described in Nahuatl as an Atlequitzonan Chimali, Chimali meaning shield. This popular divine attribute must surely relate directly to the incessant references to shield flowers, the Sochi Chimali of ghost warriors in the Cantares. For example, one of four Tlalocs in the Aztec pantheon that went by the name of Opochtli, meaning left-handed, presents a water lily shield with an eight-membered corolla no doubt to reflect the distinctive four-parted floral features of this aquatic plant group. In Aztec ritual hymns, war flowers erupt on the edge of God's floodwaters as shield flowers. They'll never die, these war flowers. They amass, ah, on the flood's border. These jaguar flowers, these shield flowers are blooming. And in like fashion, the Aztec goddess Jade Skirt, while in the company of her devotees, displays a shield with the profile of a polypetalous water lily. Note that several of her enthusiasts are beating the two types of drums that were typically employed in the so-called flower songs and drum songs. To quote hymn number 40, Shield flowers, standing up and blooming for desires and longing. On the surface of the waters, before the walls, they content us. Another aspect of jade skirt, Chalchiuhtlicue, is known as Lady Seven Serpent, Chicome Coatl. But she distinguishes herself as a goddess of sustenance, i.e. also as a maize goddess. So she displays a shield bearing a radial perspective on a Mexican lotus, as well as two ears of corn. The Florentine Codex of Bernardino de Sahagún includes illustrations of waterly shields for six distinctive gods and goddesses of the Aztec pantheon. 
each of which represents a distinctive variant rendering of the polypetalous and four-parted blossoms. Moreover, so far as I can tell, no other f flower has ever been employed as a shield decoration, nor as a war symbol. But in the Cantares, these shield flowers are identified specifically as both war flowers and as aquatic reed flowers. Blaze flowers and shield flowers are blooming in abundance. These flower shoots are for the taking. They break up and disperse themselves plentifully, these golden ones, as captives, and they pass away but revive themselves as reed flowers, as colored standards, passing away again as captives. That several ancient gods and goddesses would adopt the same floral shield in central Mexico, as well as the Yucatan at Palinque, suggests to me that we are dealing with a very ancient symbol. And to be sure, we can trace the use of the water lily image as a war symbol to artistic conventions from the classic period of the Teotihuacanos, north of the Valley of Mexico. A painting of one of these shields, as redrawn by the widely published Mesoamerican specialist, Arthur Miller, is identified as the Shield of Tlaloc by this author. Accordingly, this identification confirms a very early adoption of lotus shield motifs. This shield is surrounded by a lotus bud and blossom design, inside which we observe another ancient Aztec symbol that was apparently employed by the much earlier Toltecs, this being the Olin sign, which seems to be formed here by distinctly knotted, pliant lotus flower stalks. The word Olin translates in Nahuatl as movement or as a stirring, and relates to one of several alternative titles for Ipaltinemig in the Cantares, one being Seolintzin, the title meaning first movement or one movement. For moving and stirring, Olin, is what God's sacred flowers do when they descend from his paradise. Since this water lily shield is a product of the classic Toltec civilization at Teotihuacan, it is quite relevant to the interpretation of polychrome murals at Tepantitla, which we discussed earlier. These wall paintings are our first and perhaps most detailed depictions of a typical watery paradise of gods in Mesoamerica. And clearly, these 1,800-year-old paintings seem to have sprung from the pages of the Cantares Mexicanos, at least in terms of their symbolism. We have here a proverbial green land, a water world, a land of flowers, and a vast shoreline of the gods that is covered with weeping flowers visited by flocks of singing birds. Note the scrolls that emanate from their beaks. Human revenants masquerade as quetzal birds while they pay devotion to a sacred tree of life that springs from the fertile waters and the back of a prominent focal bird goddess. There are two types of plants that command this divine scene. One being water lilies, which surround the spectacle within water currents that flow continuously around the perimeter of the mural, much as they did at Kakashla. These flowers typically grow from the mouth of an aquatic skull god that surrounds the four quarters of paradise, this being the deified form of the Aztec god known as Tlaloc. We would be mistaken to think that these scenes were ancillary in any shape or form to the fundamental beliefs and practices of the Teotihuacanos, because every symbol we observe on this urn applies equally to both Tlaloc and his water lilies, 
recalling the following passage of the later lyrics of the Cantares. I, a singer, beat my drum flower as a mud puppy soldier. So let's be pleasured with flower banners, you who make his home among the many colored water lilies. Personified avian attendants to the focal bird goddess lend a generous hand by inseminating the goddess's waters of life with an abundance of water lily buds and flowers, many of which pour forth and drip with nectar. Since eye insignias are attached to the gushing nectar of flowers, the inference seems to complement the Aztec lyrical concept of weeping flowers. To quote, chalk and feathers come spinning, chalk and feathers come spinning, weeping flowers, shield flowers, stand up, blooming, desirable and attractive on the water surface. Or elsewhere, let no heart be troubled while here on earth, for though we are sad, though we weep, emulate them, the flowers, emulate them, my friend. You adorn yourself with sad flowers, weeping flowers, and praise him. Your flower sighs at him, the ever-present, at him, the ever-near. Now, obviously, the Cantares are focused more on a masculine creator spirit instead of a fertility goddess. But the symbols and the symbolic themes in the Cantares are almost perfectly compatible with iconography at Te Tepantitla. The goddess that figures so prominently on this mural has been interpreted in countless ways by historians. But she is as much a bird goddess as an aquatic flower goddess because she stands prominently among standing water lilies that extend across her chest while living in the realm of the Toltecs, the people of Tolan. Both realistic as well as stylized depictions of water lilies stand before her and call to mind the Nahuatl term for water lilies, Atla Quetzonan, which we note in our podcast on the Cantares translates literally as goddess of the waves. And so I ask our listeners, might not this goddess be the namesake of this central Mexican plant, goddess of the waves? Because here, while standing within her wavy waters, she seems to represent both the flower and the Quetzal bird, both of which Identities are associated with life giver and his creations on his eternal shores. To quote, Upon this flowery flood, a feathery intoxicant arrives within the home of the jade flower, and trogons, trogon is a tropical bird of Mexico, whirling flowers distribute themselves. He sings within, he warbles, Therein, the Quetzal. And above all, she casts forth an abundance of her floral nectar over her verdant domains. Now, the other dominant plant in this scene, at the sacred home of the Teotihuacan Pantheon, is a spectacular tree of life, whose shoots seemingly spring to life from the goddess. And like the numerous attempts to interpret the meaning of Teotihuacan's poorly understood goddess, many scholars have attempted to identify this cosmic plant with a specific plant species from central Mexico, but usually in a wholly speculative and imprecise manner. This is typical in art history studies and publications, because the floor of Mexico is estimated to comprise around 30,000 vascular plant species, and the topic is obviously quite complicated. But, as a seasoned floristic explorer that has covered ground in Mexico for around 50 years, 
allow me to offer up a novel hypothesis on the identity of the Toltec's proverbial weeping tree of life. To begin with, it is notable that the plant has no discernible trunk, but comprises instead a large cluster of unbranched, intertwining stems, each of which terminates in a solitary polypetalous blue and or green flower. Now, if you look closely, the basic aspect of these flowers match precisely with the full-blown water lily that stands prominently across the belly of the goddess. So this arboreal motif appears to represent a highly stylized water lily tree of sorts, analogous examples of which have turned up among various religious cults in ancient Egypt, Greece, the Near and Middle East, topics which we attend to in other episodes on Paradise Earth. We note that each flower produces a tightly clustered triad of nectar flow, as denoted by the rows of green circlets, water signs, and that each of these nectar clusters are terminated by a serpent eye motif, ostensibly to suggest teardrops. And then from these floral extrusions, we observe a flow of dispersing nectar that breaks into teardrops attached to serpent eyes again, in a manner that seems to channel the following stanzas from the Cantares. This tree of flowers, the Xochincuahuitl, this tree of flowers stands in Tamuanchan, God's home. Here, we're created, we who have been called. Our spirit, life giver, twirls us as Lord songs. What I'm creating is as gold. I'm fashioning our sacred songs as jades. Four times and they are turquoise. Tamo, God, Ipaltinemi. Twirl us around four times in Tamuanchan. Yea, be pleasured. Yea, here are the green places. Sounds pretty nice. Or, flowers descend to earth. Life giver cast them downward to earth. These sacred flowers, these most golden flowers. We shall all be adorned by these. O princes, you lords. Life giver cast them down. All these sobs. And they come heaping up these sacred flowers, these yellow flowers. Other murals among the temples at Teotihuacan give us reason to believe that water lilies played as much a role as a symbol as a ritual implement. Just as the Cantares speak of collecting the fragrant flowers, paintings at Tetitla portray young men wading out in waist-deep water to collect shells and water lily buds executed here as yellow-colored elliptical objects above the swimmer's head. No more than a stone's throw from the latter painting, we encounter the ubiquitous image of Tlaloc, who disgorges from his mouth, as is normal, the same yellow pigmented water lily buds, the same buds that we have observed in the aforementioned Tlaloc urn from Teotihuacan. The close association of waterly flowers with shells is not unknown to the cantares, as suggested by the following refrain. You are stirring as feathers. Your words are dispersing. You read flower jades. You read flower pearl shells. Let us have pleasure with these for we have envisioned God, the world owner. We are satisfied. And these buds are described in various hymns as jades that shatter, that break open to reveal the feathers of plume flowers on God's green shores. To quote, O life giver, jades break open, plumes break out, briefly, 
are your sacred flowers, these golden blossoms, now borrowed. That was from hymn number 12. And in hymn number 58, Blaze flowers and shield flowers are blossoming in abundance. These flower shoots are for the taking. They break up and disperse themselves plentifully, these golden ones, as captives. And they pass away, but revive themselves as reed flowers, as colored standards, passing away again as captives. These colorful flowers would be the same blossoms that come stirring, spinning, and twirling down from Tamoanchan. You whirl down from Tamoanchan, the flower kingdom. Ah, these flowers increase, song root flowers. And from within these feather flowers, you sing, O mediator. You create the fragrance, you stand and whirl. So let's all be enraptured. Participants in the flower wars of the Cantares cover a range of biologically diverse creatures, especially in terms of birds, apparently to reflect the multi-hued plume flowers that they symbolize. As we recall, water lilies, as multicolored reed flowers, congregate along Life Giver's green shores in hymn number 45. How do these songs, these flowers exist? These multicolored reed flowers, these flowers of the sun, Tonala Shochit, that make jade water paintings dance? The same notion is expressed in the following excerpt, but in the context of plume flowers, not reed flowers. Various birds. These trogons and rosy swans are like feathers to you, God. By these you paint your drums on earth. These flowers are your riches. They come from his home in the heavens. Only from his home come all these flowers. Among these flowers we have white varieties, with which snow egrets, juvenile herons, and white eagles perhaps a native kite that tends to inhabit riverbanks, are associated, such as, My songs, these flowers, are whirling, so I set them free. I come from where white flowers stand, so these pictures stand up, shining in your home. Or in another hymn, a white flower cackler am I, now arrived. This is my feather fan, I, Netzawal Koyot. I've come from Tamuanchan, from where the flowers descend. And right next to a white flower, we often find beaming blue water lilies, which, when appearing as reincarnate turquoise blur birds or blue birds, known in Nahuatl as Shiu Tototl, they dance and sing. To quote, As turquoise birds, in one aggregation, the lords are entertained. And with these reeds, these flowers, we dance. Or in another hymn, Turquoise flowers are shining green. From the banks of turquoise waters, I hear them all, I, from Huishotzinkan. And why? Because turquoise columns stand, created. Santa Maria, the heavenly columns, stand created. God rules over this realm forever. He cradles the earth and sky. His jades, his flowers, are in your hands. Just as commonly, Nay, more frequently, the flowers and birds share a rosy color, denoted in Nahuatl by the word tlau. To quote from the hymns, And all the roseate swans, the tropils, are spreading their wings in flower land. They are the princes. They are my nephews. 
But these peculiar birds are also greening, as though they were photosynthetic. Now these are greening, these God's flowers, these his rose-colored swan water juveniles, these that stand as offspring, these that stand all lush with leaves. Aya, we little children, will cut them. No less interestingly, these same waterfowl are closely associated with Maya gods that share the same close connection with water lilies, with Maya water lilies, known in their language as Nikteha, which means water flower. And note that the precise Nahuatl equivalent describing the Cantares flowers is Sochiat, meaning water flowers, Sochi at. Birds are not the only ghost warriors that take wing. Participants occasionally metamorphose into flower butterflies, usually to inhale the wonderful fragrance of God's flowers. But just the same, ghost warriors also descend as butterfly flowers, not flower butterflies. One stanza states the case as such. The flower butterfly, the Sochi Papalot, is pleasing himself on these. He inhales our flowers, our hand flowers, our fans, our reed fragrance. With these, he is whirled. Or in another song, Quetzal butterfly flowers come flying as plumes. I make them to dance. Now, the first iconographic image that comes to my mind when I ponder these stanzas is a very famous stone sculpture of an Aztec god that most historians have identified as the Aztec god known as Sochi Pili, meaning flower prince whose body is adorned with a variety of flowers. Like the bird goddess of Teotihuacan, the floral designs have been interpreted in so many and sundry ways. But as a systematic botanist, I can vouch that none of these flowers can be identified as any specific plant or plant group with any certainty. Save for one type of flower that we observe here. And these are the four large blossoms that surround the base of the plants of the god's pedestal. Because of the ecstatic look on this deity's face, a number of commentators have suggested that he is under the sway of some sort of narcotic plant. These varied botanical viewpoints notwithstanding, there is a critical observation that has never been taken into consideration. And that is that the flower man here is sitting upon the surface of water. The series of circlets or jade signs, the chalchiwitl, that rim the upper surface of the platform denote a water surface, much as the continuous wavy line observed just below the jade circlets. Together they're indicative of a pool of water which gives me reason to wonder if this icon might not as well be a study on a ghost warrior, if not a singer, feeling the pleasures of God's paradise in Tolan. Floating upon this body of water, we observe four full-blown polypetalous flowers with a large centralized disc. Sound familiar? Once again, this could only be a water lily. And stationed upon the flowers, we observe butterflies that have extended their coiled tongues to inhale the fragrance and perhaps sample the flower's nectar. Symbolically, the four flowers likely represent the cardinal points of the cosmos, which suggests the universality of the flower's significance. On God's eternal shores, any singer could become a singing flower a warbling bird, or indeed a butterfly flower or a flower butterfly. Consider, for example, 
I, a singer, I'll pass away and change into a butterfly flower. And I'll pass away to soar into this aggregation. Ah, and I will revel in songs, in flowers. So that was a butterfly flower. But another says, I, a flower butterfly, let me sing beside him. Ah, this flower of mine, this creation will revel. I open them up, I sing these songs. In addition to varied petal colors of water lilies, the fragrant flowers of Ipaltinemi are also frequently associated with the sun, in the sense that they open to the sun at dawn and mirror the color of the sun when they are open. To quote, sacred flowers of the dawn, Klawisal Xochitl, are blooming in the rainy place of flower wars, which belongs to him, the ever-present, the ever-near. Those heart-pleasing flowers are laden with sunstruck dew. Or similarly, let's go drink the delicious flower water in flower land, our home, the earth with celestial flowers. These heart pleasers, this dew of life, are emanating fragrance in our home. Sunflowers are blooming in the land of plenty. Sunflowers, indeed. The same flower and sun associations are encountered in Maya tradition as well. So this symbolic relationship appears to have had a broad Mesoamerican appeal and for thousands of years. The sun god at Palenque, for example, employs Mexican lotus flowers as a conduit between the heavens of the Maya realm and their watery underworld. And you may also recall the same snaggletooth god that emerges from a backdrop of four water lilies again on the dynastic seal of the famous Maya emperor of Palenque, known formally as Kinich Janab Pakal, Pakal in short. His formal name translates as Solar Water Lily Shield. When ghost warrior revenants appear as flowers, they beam with the sunlight, claiming, as flowers you come filled with sunshine in blaze land, and fragrantly so. The relationship between the sun and sunflowers in Aztec iconography is a recurrent theme. And we observe this notion on a vessel from the region of Tolan Cholola, that would be Cholula today, which portrays a two-headed bird embracing a polypetalous flower with an olin insignia placed in, in its center. As discussed in our separate study of Mesoamerican sun gods on Paradise Earth, the glyph for the movement of the sun, or in this case, a solar plume flower, is the olin symbol. And all of these motifs agree with lyrical themes of the Cantares Mexicanos. A similar solar flower is carved into a toponotzli drum the flower song singers, that was presumably disinterred in the Valley of Mexico. This sun image complements the refrain. How do these songs, these flowers exist, these many-colored reed flowers, these flowers of the sun, that make jade water paintings dance? In this work of art, we are unsure if this solar disk represents a flower or a sun just as in Aztec hymns. They reflect one another. Reed flowers not only look like the sun, but the sun seems to enhance the resplendence of the flowers when its rays bounce off their surface, which is filled with the sunstruck dew of life. This descriptive expression is repeated over and over again 
in the Cantares. And the feature is actually an accurate description of water lilies during their first day of flowering. Because water lily blossoms glisten brightly with the color of the sun when copious nectar secretions fill up the flower's central golden disk with a liquid exudate. Consider, for example, the following stanza of the Cantares. They led me to a valley, a land of plenty, a land of flowers, and there I found them, laden with sunstruck dew. There I saw those colorful, precious flowers, fragrantly precious flowers, clothed in dew, filled with sunstruck water. And they said to me, cut whatever flowers you prefer. Make yourselves happy with them, singers. And when you arrive, deliver some of those flowers to our lordly comrades, those who will satisfy the world's owner. The key to this passage is that the flowers are filled with sunstruck water. In a botanical context, this would not be due, as linguists have surmised in translating the metaphor. No, as you can see, this would be nectar. And in keeping with the interchangeable symbols of flowers and birds, the same motif applies to divine birds and plume flowers. Let me saunter through this grove where the trogons are. Let me wander through this flower grove of rosy swans. That's where the flowers are bending with sunstruck dew. Or no less, give us contentment with your flowers, O God, O life giver. These flowers are budding, blossoming, turning gold. They are shining. So the flowers appear to reflect a golden radiance upon the dawning of the sun. Sacred flowers of the dawn are blooming in the rainy place of flowers that belongs to him, the ever-present, the ever-near. Heart-pleasing flowers are laden with sunstruck dew. As noted earlier, the overbrimming nectar of these flowers was likened to the tears of life giver, or otherwise, to the tears of singing and sobbing revenants. And pictorially, this same concept applies to the tree of life in the Tepantitla temple, some 1,500 years before the authorship of these sacred hymns. The border of these murals is sometimes surrounded by highly stylized, meandering and intertwining stalks of water lilies, most of which emphasize, in one way or another, the four-parted character of water lily flowers. Sometimes they point downward, as this is the habit of water lily flowers. After pollination, the stalks coil down, bend downward, uh, and you can no longer see the petals, but only the four external sepals. And these flowers drip profusely with eye signs attached to the droplets. Recalling the cantatis expression, flower tears come trickling down to the flower drum at the singing place. We encounter these same four-parted floral motifs throughout Teotihuacan, where there is porcelain amulets, or as decorative insignias on ceramics, which are conventionally portrayed as a four-segmented flower in a radial view, but sometimes as a triad of water lily sepals when the flowers are portrayed in, in profile, uh, which would mean resting on a water surface. We note the attached three-membered motif on this three-membered flower, is suspiciously similar to the water lily design that issues from the mouth of Tlaloc. We observe numerous serpent eyes on a structure at Teotihuacan that are closely associated with a multitude of water lily flowers. But not only at Teotihuacan, for serpent eye symbols are also associated with water lilies in many other sites of Mesoamerica. 
such as Kakashtla, where the inferior ovary of a water lily similarly contains a serpent eye symbol. This would suggest that the symbolic association between a reptile eye and the water lily is an early and enduring uh, symbolic motif. To support the suggestion, we encounter this same symbolic relationship on a Maya mural at Tulum on the eastern coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, which was likely constructed just a century or two before the age of the conquest. However, this site is distinguished from other Yucatec Mayan sites for having adopted Aztec iconographic practices in their imagery as observed in this endemic feathered serpent motif whose body terminates in an eagle on one end and a serpent's head on the other. Water lily buds sprout from the ears and tails of this cosmic serpent, while a full-blown water lily flower opens widely in the middle of the creature's coiling body. And with an infixed serpent eye, I emphasize the role of the weeping serpent eyes because the significance of this widespread motif has long been a source of conjecture among academics. Clearly, the relationship between tears and sunstruck floral dew is suggested in numerous Aztec songs. Just to quote one of these, chalk and feathers come spinning, weeping flowers, shield flowers, stand up blooming, desirable and attractive on the water surface that we find in hymn number 40. And this observation may well provide a key to understanding the reason for the Aztec and Maya's obsession with water lilies. If we take the Cantares Mexicanos for their word, the sunstruck nectar of reed flowers appears to have been drunk by the singers as an inebriant in a metaphorical context, the singers say they please their hearts with flower tears. Who brings the dispersing lords and gives a gift of flower brilliance to the eagle jaguar princes? Who intoxicates them with his flower dew of life? That question, who, of course, refers rhetorically to life giver. In another refrain, in the water he sings and warbles, and his fellow swans, all noble lords, these wastecs, hey, are chattering, and they are quaffing feather flower water wine. The word for wine here is octli, which of course would not be wine to the Aztecs, for they didn't ferment grapes. And from flower land proceed all the whirling flowers that make hearts spin. Whirled ones make you high flowers. And again, I'm a tipsy Waztec now, so I'm greening as a flower eagle. I'm spilling the flowers inebriant. The Cantares Mexicanos are simply replete with references of this type. We know for a fact that a few of the singers actually spiked their flower dew drinks with magical Mexican mushroom extracts. Since two incidental stanzas in the hymnal confess as much. I've drunk a mushroom potion, Nanaka Oakley. My heart is weeping, and I grieve on earth. I am poor. Casual references such as these only confirm what other historical records from this time period have revealed. And that is that the Aztecs had a, had a strong hankering for hallucinogens. But not only the Aztecs. Mushroom stones among the Maya in Guatemala are believed to represent uh, the spirit of a psychotropic fungus. And we are now well aware that these 
ancient habits were condemned by Catholic clergy, as the Spanish considered such customs as the work of the devil. To be engaged in such practices could prove lethal in the age of the Inquisitions, and that would be lethal for natives that were caught in the act of eating inebriants. And no less so for those that partook of psychotropic nightshades, such as jimson weeds, whose use the Cantares mention in a single and glancing refrain. But these ancillary references are almost silenced by the constant allusions to the oh-so-pleasurable sensations of sunstruck dew preparations, called in Nahuatl Oktli. For use of this substance was apparently the means by which singers and, and God's birds gained access to life-giver's watery paradise. Let me render a portion of hymn number 79 in modern-day terms. Be gladdened by this flower land, because last night I was so drunk, totally zonked out, and today again I am plowed. So hey, wouldn't your heart prefer this? And take my hand, and let's take off to our home. He's drunk, because he's drunk it. Oh, rowdy parrot, we're gone. He is so drunk. And since the narcotic flowers are also identified with either plume flowers or cosmic waterfowl, even life-givers' birds are described as being intoxicated or as being intoxicating. Lifting my voice, I breathe down, I bring down intoxicating flowers those turquoise swans. Now, while many, if not most historians, from the dawn of Spanish control of Mexico to the present day, often focus on the brutal side of Aztec social and ritual life, based on the well-known habitual practices of Aztec communities in their practice of child sacrifices, the flaying of human skin, the removal of living hearts in public ceremonies, the abuse of slaves, and so on. Such customs seem incongruent with the festivities and habits that we have covered here in the singing rituals of the Mexica. Still, the Spanish clergy would have none of it. So temples, altars, books, ritual implements, and even reticent traditionalists were systematically put to the torch to forge a new way, a new day in religious expression. These extreme measures of church control during the 16th century are responsible in large part for the many and substantial gaps in our current understanding of pre-Columbian religious views of Mesoamerican cultures. But even among the ruins and ash heaps of the fallen Aztec Empire, we have excavated sufficient material to support progress in our ongoing attempts to reconstruct the worldviews and, and ritual practices of the original Mexicans. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a closer scrutiny of iconographic records, especially with respect to the plant world and its relationship to the practice of religion, holds much promise for a better awareness of Mesoamerica's long-lost civilizations and their burnt-down history. To this end, I recommend you also explore our related episodes on Paradise Earth pertaining to water lily symbolism in the Americas. As many of the subjects and symbolic themes that we encounter in the Cantares were no less relevant to many and various distant civilizations that once shared close contacts with the Mexica.